Welcome to the Genealogy Radio Show, the radio show that's keeping you in the loop. And this week's show is all about space and place and how it relates to genealogical research. We often think of dates and years and how they're important for genealogy research, but we often forget about the importance of place. Place is extremely important when you're looking at genealogical sources as you're going back through time. And today I'm going to focus on the O'Brien lineage and using a place like Ennis Abbey or the Friary in Ennis. I was just visiting the Friary in Ennis this morning and what a wonderful location it is. It has been open for the last three weeks and it's wonderful to see this OPW site back in action after quite a number of months closed due to COVID-19. Had a wonderful visit there looking at the O'Brien history of Ennis Friary and just how far back it goes. And really, that's where it starts with the power of the O'Briens and them being able to endow an abbey and so on. And it goes right back to the middle of the 13th century, when everything was happening in Ireland at that time under English rule and English crown forces coming in and changing the type of land tenure and so on with Thomas de Clare in Ireland and so, and, and so forth. It's a really exciting time for O'Brien family history. Really, we looked at the dates, which I had been, you know, the boards in Ennis Abbey are really informative. So you can go around and you can see information boards on the wall and it gives you that bit of added lore that you might not find in any articles and so on. So place is really important to go and visit if you can. And indeed, it was a, a lovely visit this morning. One of the aspects of it is to actually look at the age of the building and what's happened with it over time. Because that when that building was there, it formed part of the cloister as well, which is now a restaurant. And it probably extended out with gardens and so on. Now it's in the set, set in the middle of a thriving urban centre, but Ennis didn't become the county town of County Clare until the, in the middle of the 16th century, and maybe a little bit earlier than it. So you've got to think that the town grows up around the abbey. The abbey doesn't grow up around the town. As you look across from the entrance of it, you can see the river. And that was a really important part where it was bringing up goods. It was self-sufficient. It was able to link places. And I believe it was considered an hour or a mile away from Clonroad Moor, which was the palace in the 13th century of the O'Brien stronghold. So it became very strongly linked through a straight thoroughfare that is known in the manuscripts and so on. One of the most exciting things in it is the head that's believed to be dated from 1306 of uh, Thorlock O'Brien. And Cochrane Thorlock, which is freely available online through the UCC Celt website, gives you a great insight as to what's happening with the O'Briens in the 13th century and their internecine feudal battles and so on. So as we went in, there was wonderful panels on the wall, beautiful stone carvings and figures of people and so on. And little touches that our wonderful guide, Aoife, showed us as well during the course of the visit. So we were having a look around and, and looking at how the the friary displays its apse and sacristy and so on. And I was recalling how small the places seem to be when you think of a courtroom being held in, 15, in the 1570 period there and that becoming a centre for assizes. It wasn't a holding place for many people, even though multiple people were executed. So in many, many ways, how we see things and when we use genealogy for place always helps even if you were to just to google it online and make sure that you looked at the place before you started visualizing what that might must have been like 
Now, we looked around at the tombs and we got a great deal of help from our guide, Aoife, on the O'Brien tomb, which is facing the Craig tomb. And she told us there was a, a Cray or Craig tomb that was possibly an O'Brien tomb earlier than the 1306 uh, remains of the canopy, as it's known. And that was very significant because there possibly is two rival branches of the O'Briens excitingly buried at the same amount of time with our manuscript evidence of Cotter and Thurlock. So that is exciting indeed, and exciting to be able to visualize, well, which branch was it? Which, what happened there? In 1306, the McNamara's and the O'Briens are actually buried there. It's, it's uh, the O'Brien, the McNamara's really take great pride in making sure that they are, you know, known to have been buried there. As we're letting you know about Cotterham Tarlock, it's nice to look at a little bit of the source. And it's really, Cotterham Thorlock is the triumphs of Thorlock. So if you have any O'Brien history or McNamara history, you really need to, to have a look at this. It was written by the McGraths as well. And they even have a tomb in Ennis Friary today, which is quite significant. So the place for the O'Briens is the north bank of the Fergus on this day called Clon Road. And there was a circular hole in residence which is there. So around 1242, just before that Ennis Friary or Ennis Abbey comes to be about, Donna Carbrook starts to um, plan on how to get the friars, who were really the in crowd at the time, to get them to come to Ennis. And he would have very much liked them to be there at that point. So it's wonderful to look at a building that has survived for that length of time. So Donna Carbrook O'Brien, son, good son was Tyg, and he, his, he was narrow water and he would have died quite young. So perhaps that is the tomb of one of the sides because what happens is that there's a great deal of internecine strife that starts to happen around 1268. And this is a wonderful times of the Battle of Kilbarren. You know, the, you see the factions of Clan Cullen, the ODs, the High Blood, the, the, the Macanmara and so on. So really, really lovely to see this. And the description architecturally and, and archaeologically in Cotterham Thorlock is lovely when you match the building and see what they would have seen at that time. They do try and build a castle in actual Quinn, but they have to abandon that castle in the 13th century, the Norman forces. So the O'Briens are really holding strong sway at this time. And in 1306, we know that part of that tomb with a butterfly and a shamrock and the remains of so on and the little inscriptions that are there and how they used to use it for festivities with the priest standing there and so on and using that as a base so people would always be looking at this is the power and the might of this wonderful uh, O'Brien lineage starting to take shape in the midst and, and even looking like royalty with the curled hair and the crown and the regality and the and the, the fight with the church of, for power. And remember, the papacy is a very strong power at this time as well. So it really does make a huge difference on how you can visualize what's happening in Ennis even before it is a wonderful town as such. So remember that Clare is known as Thomond at this time, and you have the clan Mahan, and the MacMahons have a tomb also in the Friary as well. It later becomes such a part of the structure of the early town and the shiring process, where it has to be used as a court house and a court a size and so on. So it's really interesting to note that there wouldn't have been that many buildings of stone at this time that could have been used in safety because they had to be safe inside there when they were carrying out such dastardly deeds and so on of trying the local populace. 
So this is something that's really important to, to think of as well. So Cochrane Tharlock is a, a really, really useful one to be able to look at, and it is translated in and with the UCC Celt site, and it does really tie in to the Ennis Friary, which is been there since the 13th century and so on. So as we toured around, we had a look at the wonderful carvings of the heads, and it was nice to be able to see that they would have been all individual and so on. And the Franciscan friar in the town of Venice would have been very important that they had patronage and so on, so that they really did kind of, uh, they were able to make a, a living. So the ruling O'Brien dynasty supported Ennis Friary for most of its existence. So therefore, we know that the first Earl of Thomond was buried there and, and other O'Brien lineages as well. And following the suppression of the monasteries in the 16th century, the Friary continued to function for a while, despite its loss of lands. In the early, and so it would have had lands attached to it as well. We see it as a singular uniform building, but it's not. It had lands all around it. In the 17th century, the buildings were handed over to the Church of Ireland as a place of worship, and it was used as such until the late 19th century. After the construction of a new Church of Ireland building, the friary fell into a ruin, and is managed by the Office of Public Works since the late 19th century. It was formally returned to the Franciscan order, in 1969. It still remains in a ruined state, but it's open to the public. We were very fortunate. We didn't have to pay any admission. The OPW heritage sites are free at the moment, I believe, and that's a wonderful opportunity for our visitors and so on. The Franciscan friars have moved their community to a new friary and it's nearby. So the old Ennis friary is located on Abbey Street near the River Fergus. Donna Carbrook O'Brien, son of Donal Moore O'Brien, High King of Ireland, became King of Thomond after a bloody feud with his bro brother, Murtuk Finn O'Brien. Reportedly, in order to do penance, he decided to build a friary on an island in the River Fergus called uh, Clun Row, meaning so Clon Road, I presume this would. Uh, translate to Meadow of the Long Rowing, which may have been the site of an earlier church. After the Normans occupied Limerick, Dunnock submitted to King John and moved his seat of power to Clon Road. In 1216, he is reported to have offered shelter to the Franciscan Order in Ennis in 1241 to 1242. This Dunnock financed three monasteries. He rebuilt the Cistercian Abbey at Inishlanaut in Tipperary, built a house for the Dominicans at Limerick and a Franciscan friary at Ennis, which would also serve as the family place of burial. Dunnock died in 1244. He was actually buried at the Dominican house in Limerick, suggesting that the friary at Ennis was not yet close to being finished at that point. So, this was a dream that he would have had, but it wasn't realized within his lifetime. In 1276, Edward I granted the King of Thomond to Thomas de Clare. Thorlock O'Brien refused to relinquish control of the land. And in 1277, Brian O'Rourke did actually try to do a deal with uh, Thomas de Clare, but was executed by Thomas de Clare. So, Tarlock gifted bells, crucifixes, and blue stained glass to the friary, and Tarlock's son, Murtagh O'Brien, king from 1311 to 1343, were both buried at the friary. So, really nice to know that what's going on there with the lineages and so on. The friary would have been the only source for people, really, of administration for 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 that in the, in this region and you have mac and mcnamara adding a sacristy and a refectory to the friary he died of the plague in 1347 he's buried at the friary it continued to prosper and in 1350 a papal indulgence was granted for the feast of saint francis and saint anthony so that's really lovely to to know and 1375 
Richard of Windsor granted the friars permission to travel beyond Thomond in search of funds. So we get to see how this community grew well into the 15th century and how things were added to the cloister and the transcript and another 75 years later, the Belfry Towers and 1507, the Order's Provincial Chapter was held at Ennis. But then we have the suppression of the monasteries by Henry VIII and Murk O'Brien surrendered and he received the properties of Corkham Row Abbey and Clare Abbey. Donnock O'Brien Murrock received Quinn Abbey. Ennis Friary was granted to John Naylan. Murrock died in 13, 1543. And despite the official suppression, the Franciscans held on. And the order was able to operate at Ennis until 1570 and in secret after that. Edward Fitton held the assizes in Ennis Friary, having been ousted by Connor O'Brien. And that caused a lot of problems for Connor. He had to hide in France for a couple of years. And indeed, it was the lucky that the Earl of Thomond and the Thomonds survived that little period. But he was related to Elizabeth I. It is believed that Connor was neither fond of old Gaelic ways nor of the Franciscans, and he did declare himself Anglican. But how he, he, you know, we, I'd say you were looking at the fourth Earl of Thomond for that, and was who was a very staunch Protestant, but married to a Catholic. So obviously the Ennis Friary did survive and so on in many ways, as to as to how. It goes, it's, it's a very interesting point. So really, if you're looking at the old O'Brien lineage and the old O'Brien roots, you, and you want to see how they're fitting into the new world of uh, friars, which is new at this time, it's lovely to be able to go and see Ennis Friary. We had an absolutely wonderful visit there today well looked after it's a beautiful building it's very well kept and there's lots being done with it at the moment which are really exciting when you're looking at the stonework and so on so today that's what we covered at the importance of place and genealogy and when you're looking at a surname how you look and how you can see your ancestors and how they would have you know, where they were buried, what was important to them, why did they move, what's happening with the family and what's happening with the, the family branches and so on. So there is nothing more important than place in relation to Irish genealogy and so on. And place name meaning is really important as well. So knowing your place and knowing Irish places is, is, is important. And there is a lovely article, Interrelationship Between Genealogy and Geography, is, you know, is, is a nice one as well. And I'll be using, that's written by Desmond Gilmore in Trinity College Dublin and Almer Barry, St. Patrick's College, Shrumkondra. Family Histories and Geographies, Interrelationships Between Genealogy and Geography. And I, I used that for a little bit of research for the show today. And quote, the basis of this paper is that family history and geography are fundamentally interrelated and that geography can benefit from the association of a rapidly expanding field of genealogy. A number of influences have contributed to the huge growth, quote, in family history, and it has been intrinsic in the importance of space and geography because the use of maps and administrative areas and the critical importance of places. So it's a great, um, great, that's a lovely article to have and very nice to be able to look at the different software packages of how even if you can't come and visit us at the moment that you can look up the history of places online and we will be looking at in our series starting in September, we're looking at place and genealogy for the whole series going right up to Christmas. So I'm really looking forward to that. We'll also be doing some genealogy classes in UCC where we're running our six you know, taste or classes that teach you how to dip your toe into the water online. And we'll be delighted to be able to do that as well. So today I would just like to finish with 
absolutely thanking you for your support of the genealogy radio show and thank you to visiting Ennis Friary which gave us such a wonderful lineage of the O'Briens it was wonderful to be there with Susan and her friend and bring her and go back to the O'Brien ancestry going back seven and eight hundred years and bringing us further back in time on how you could use place and space for Irish family research.